We talked about uh, object relation theory, Meg will remember, mm -hmm. and how well it fits into the group situation mm -hmm. with part objects that, that people personify and so on and so forth. And he thought for a while and then he said, you know, I don't really need it. And we puzzled it this out. What does that? He wouldn't ever explain properly what it meant. Mm -hmm. And then he said, well, it's all in the matrix. When once we have the concept of the matrix and the nodal points, we can dispense with all this. So I absolutely agree with you. He, was, he wanted a sort of unified theory. He didn't want bits and pieces from, from other theories. Other people have spoken about the first time that they met him. I can't say what, what the first time was I met him. It was as though I sort of crept in to his shining a uh, area through Malcolm Pines, who I, uh, uh, Malcolm asked me to share a room with him at the practice, and I was just starting in private practice as a psychoanalyst. And it so happened that gradually I got absorbed into this um, area. But Michael, for me, still is a guiding light. When I met <laughs> Malcolm in 1948, I was dating a young man at that time that I married the same week in London called Schutzenberger, who was doing research on sociometry of Marino. And, Malka, um, and Michael make many links between Marino and his work in London in 1948, mm. telling a lot how much he has done role playing in the army in his groups. So he did make the links. And I would like to give some support to what Meg said, Meg Sharp, because his attitude towards men and women was slightly different, and maybe he was a more cr contradicting woman than he would men, because I remember he very warmly greeted me when uh, Rita Leal and, uh, and um, Edouard de Cortésar invited me to join his group in uh, Palanza at La Maggiore very warmly. That was a very uh, strange and uh, amazingly happy experience of gracious living, having a seminar and a boat, uh, eating, dancing, making music, diving together, and having theoretical seminars. By the way, Elizabeth is a fantastic swimmer and diver. <laughs> <laughs> but to come back, when I came to London a few years later, he looked at me and said, and you are, excuse me, I'm not boasting, but he said, you are young, beautiful, intelligent, striking, forget it. If you want to be a group analyst and a good therapist, shadow yourself a lot. Oh. Yeah, shadow yourself a lot. And I thought it was a very, very good lesson. Because you cannot be a group analyst or a therapist if you are, or if people think you are outstanding. So I start dressing myself in black, putting glasses, trying to shadow and shut up a lot <laughs> for many years. I had met him two years earlier when I was on a walk with a friend of mine in Hampstead Heath, and it was a bitterly cold day. And at that time, I was not even a student yet. I think I had been to one or two meetings of the Group Analytic Society on Monday nights to, as a guest, somebody's guest. And then we encountered Dr. Fuchs and Mrs. Fuchs, and they came towards me, or us, and I was quite surprised that he recognized me. And he talked about a January workshop that he had attended, so full of enthusiasm. He never felt the cold. He went on talking for a long time. I'm, I'm still thinking about um, the idea was, was he really arrogant or was he terribly self-assured? I, of course, under the influence of tran massive transference, experienced him not as arrogant, but as enormously self-assured. For instance, when we discussed the word conductor versus group analyst, 
he would, the idea was that the word conductor came from him. It took me a very long time to discover it came from Adorno and had been used before. And he integrated all these ideas and then they came out as, uh, as his own. But the most impressive affair that happened to us while I was in training with him was a, a group of uh, American producers wanted to make a film about conductor styles. And they came to us, to the institute, and we discussed how this should be done, or rather it was discussed. And the idea was that one wouldn't produce a, a, a proper group, because obviously one can't do that. But we, these, his supervision group, or his theory group, would stage a group and, and, and hold a discussion. And this was done, and of course we were absolutely delighted to, to appear on film for the first time in our lives. And I dashed off to the, to the hairdresser and bought another blouse and so on. And then uh, we sat around and did this beautifully. We acted our heads off, actually. And he did not say one word. And this film, of course, never appeared because they didn't know what to do with him. They didn't understand that this was a style of conducting. <laughs> but in fact, the whole thing worked terribly well. But I thought, now here is someone who really knows what he's doing. In, in, in the face of provocation, he holds to his view of saying, having minimal intervention. I remember quite well that I was rather disappointed. I ex ex had expected someone uh, of brilliance, of uh, charisma, of uh, uh, something shining, and I found a very humble, quiet, old grandfather who was sitting there uh, almost a bit sleepy, drowsy. So uh, he gave the impression sometimes uh, closing his eyes that you never knew was he really uh, listening or not. But then his attitude changed completely. When anything seemed to be tense or anything seemed to be blocking, he seemed to be quite awake. And then he started asking. And he wanted to know everything that was going up. And he didn't uh, give in for uh, before he knew, before he really knew what was all about. He was asking again and again, what do you mean by that? What is your idea about it? I don't understand. Please, could you tell me something about this word or this concept? And he was asking and asking and asking till he had an idea of what it was all about. And then he sat back and he seemed to be in complete uh, sort of uh, feeling at, at ease and not having any need to uh, chase anybody into his psychopathology, at, at he once time said. Uh, we as a group were chasing someone into his psychopathology, and we were very good at that, and we almost were on the point. And then he intervened and said, stop it, please. What are you doing? You are chasing him into his psychopathology. And uh, it was really finding out what it was, what someone uh, meant by it. He wanted to understand what it meant for him uh, to be alive, to be human, and it was such a deep respect of what it meant to be human. And I remember uh, when I told about this attitude of being almost asleep and then being very actively uh, looking that, the, that someone is coming out with his ideas and his primal attitude, uh, I told it to a friend of mine who was uh, how, how do you, uh, gynecologa, I don't know what uh, this is. Gynecologist. Gyne gynecologist. He said, well, this is the ideal attitude uh, someone like us has to have, uh, to be asleep as long as you're not needed, but not too much. You have to be present to be there if you are needed and to help that comes out what has to come out. Mm -hmm. And that was his primal attitude. And that was very, very impressive to find this sort of polarity between sitting back and being very uh, attentive and very uh, active in uh, helping the ideas to come out. This looks very much what, like what we say in France. Never trust the deep sleep of a sleeping cat. So I might jump at you. And this is a folk's attitude. It's very much for me the example of free-floating attention of Freud. Just relax and then being really here, here and now. 
one of the things he taught to me was to always have revolving eyes to look around everybody at the same time. And his student, Eduardo Cortezal, called it to have it as a revolving, how do you call it, in front of a, of a um, harbor. Uh, like, like, a light, yes. like a lighthouse. Lighthouse eyes. And I think this is w a very important contribution. Not to look at the people who speak in a group. Look at the people who listen and how they react and then ask them to join in and explain more of the And how did there. you feel when he was looking around? How did you feel about that? At the beginning, it was very strange because you were speaking and he was not looking at you. And then, I mean, not always, sometimes yes, sometimes no. And then it became a very important part of my training to understand that who, what is the interchange between people is as important as what is said. So what people react, how they react when they wanted to speak, how important it is for the group leader, the conductor, to see it and then branch it in. But did you feel controlled by his view or was it a kind of, what kind of view? No, I felt that I have was seen and perceived even if I don't speak and that my emotion was seen and perceived. That was very, very important. I met Fulks first in 1944 at Northfield, and I had the fortune to have been at the first Northfield exper experiment uh, with uh, Rickman and Bean. Fulks himself was very gentle, but he had an enormous, enormous uh, electrifying charisma at that time. He was 44, and I was uh, 17 years younger, I think. I found his personality absolutely riveting. He was he worked with you, he was puzzled, he was terribly curious. Um, he had marvelous uh, uh, blue eyes. And what he did, he spent a whole year, it's all been written up, by the way, in this book. Um, uh, he co in the end, we called it Phase B2. Um, phase B2, um, in Fuchs's career at Northfield was the most exciting of the lot when it was people that when I first met him it was just before D-Day um, then I came back at the end of the campaign and joined again and he was uh, going towards the phase B too and his gentleness was to um, uh, buttonhole the commanding officer uh, and to um, uh, talk with him very, very gently. And after a whole year of doing this, um, he persuaded um, uh, uh, Rosie, Colonel Rosie, his name was, um, persuaded him to allow him in his spare time to have eight people, soldiers, in their spare time <laughs> to meet in the small group. And that was the beginning after about a year. Was it a mixed group, the first group? All men, soldiers. All men. Oh, All yeah, years. soldiers. Yeah, yeah, but well, so no, it's well interesting you say that because there them. were ATS girls and the reason they were posted was because they had a huge cinema show uh, <coughs> the, when they were under the jurisdiction of being more anarchic. Um, and they left the place very untidy with a lot of newspaper and a lot of, um, there were ATS girls there, a lot of unused, uh, no, used condoms, you see. And that's, they, <laughs> they, the war office paid a lightning visit uh, that very night and they saw all this and of course post I helped them pack. Uh, go next day. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but um, w what I would like to say is that there's a kind of parallel uh, between w what's been happening here with this large group um, of um, that uh, Krieger has been 
uh, convening, um, which was very like their large groups um, there. And then you might say um, there were s smaller groups, which I call medium group, median groups, um, which was rather like the ward, even though the ward was about 80. It was still treated in a different way from the large group. And he would sometimes try and improve the morale in a ward by having a ward meeting. But his real interest was the small group. Um, he, nev he never got over, and I don't think the world got over, the time um, uh, uh, that happened in, uh, in B2. Um, he was so inspired. Uh, he used to rush around. He, he represented Northfield. So he himself, in his person, represented the whole of the hospital. Um, at that time, there was not much ability for the hospital, as it were, to meet uh, as a whole group. It never did anything like that, you see. Though, obviously, uh, Bian was much more radical and attempted to do something of that sort. Um, but we, after we were, um, <coughs> after the war was over, um, uh, uh, folks, I don't think ever quite recovered uh, the inspiration that uh, he felt at North. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Uh, I first met Fuchs when I went as a trainee psychiatrist to the Maudsley, uh, and I was posted to his firm in 1957. Um, where, much to my surprise, because I thought that uh, it would be a very uh, organized, orderly, and rigorous setup, I found it very relaxed, very comfortable, very easy. Just sit with the patient, it'll be all right. And I was very uh, taken by the attentiveness and the respect that he showed to me as a very junior doctor. And his caring and gentle manner there I gradually, over the years, um, was very appreciative of the enormous respect he always showed to me as a woman, because when I was doing medicine in those days, women weren't so much respected. It was, uh, it was very much a minority group. And I'm surprised that some women had different experiences, because I always came to the conclusion that he must be very um, positive towards women generally. I certainly felt this myself. He was my boss in the department, he was my supervisor, he was my theory teacher, he was my analyst, which was crazy, you'd never do that nowadays. <laughs> and in all those contexts, I felt this same sense. Although, of course, in some he was more talkative than in others. And certainly, in the therapy group, he was very quiet, very attentive, and even with his eyes closed, you knew that there was nothing that was escaping him. Do you think that this disturbed the transference and huh? working? Hmm? Did this disturb the transference working through? What, in this the analytic group, this that he was your theory teacher, your supervisor, oh, your boss? Oh, of course. How did of it course, disturb? Of course, of course. I mean, it was crazy. It was quite bizarre. But that's all there was in those days. Either you accepted that or you had nothing. And I really wanted a group analysis. And I really wanted to train that way, not in psycho psychoanalysis. And so uh, I, I just uh, went along with it. I didn't realize quite how much it, it uh, interfered with, with it until uh, two things happened, uh, not very far apart from each other. Um, one was um, uh, he, uh, he went, as, as you heard, uh, to America as a visiting professor for a year, and uh, there his wife died. And he stayed away for much longer than was planned. And I was in his therapy group here in London, and I went through some quite bad times in that group, as one does, and I felt deeply, uh, uh, um, was deeply pained not to have him there. I was very wounded and very hurt in one session, and I wouldn't go back, and I wouldn't go back until he returned. And I was furious with him. And of course, I could have been nice to him, he'd lost his wife and all that stuff, but I wasn't, I was furious with him. But it didn't last. 
The fury dissipated after about two weeks, that's all. And I never was able to feel a negative transference to him in those days. Not till after uh, I had a baby and I left the Maudsley and stopped working and I was no longer having any particular connection with him. And about a year after that, I was able to really get into the negative transference. And how did he deal with this negative transference in the group? Uh, the only time he didn't deal with it was very well, I think, was after his wife died. And that's not surprising, because, you know, to, it, it was difficult for him as well as difficult for me. But uh, subsequently, when I did it in a more settled setting, that was fine. You know, he accepted it and didn't make any fuss about it. Uh, there was one, one occasion that sticks particularly in my mind, not to do with his negative transference, but to do with my disgusting behavior. Um, and I, I mentioned this at one of the sessions here, cause it, uh, which is what reminded me of it now. Um, and I think it's worth recording, because it's not published. Um, I was uh, in the group um, in the days when he was still my god and couldn't be anything else, stuck on a pedestal. And I got absolutely furious with one of the other women patients there, also a psychiatrist. And I, I was totally unreasonable absolutely obnoxious, violently angry, and you know, it's all quite irrational. And I, I was terrible to this woman. I threw my handbag at her, and I was absolutely frightful to her. And uh, she was terrified. And uh, after a bit, I sort of ran out of steam, I suppose, and calmed down a bit. And then in that quiet moment, this very quiet, calm voice said, I wonder if you can tell us who you were talking to? I felt that he was never particularly comfortable with the negative trauma. He could accept it, but he could never really see why it had to be there. You know? He was a bit puzzled by it. He thought that it could always be worked through and understood. So in that sense, <coughs> I don't think he contributed much to deepening the negative transference. That was my experience both in my own analysis and when we were in that group together you know, later on when there was someone, you know, who was very difficult in the group. And uh, he was always puzzled. He always thought it could be worked through. And it would engage him and get interested and be trying really to get the person to give up the negative transference. So I thought there was an area of difficulty he had over that. But um, to go back to the Maudsley, which is where I first met him, um, in what I think was a rather mutually delinquent phase, because I was looking for a training analyst, and I was put in touch with him as a training analyst for the Anna Freud group, for the B group. And he didn't have time available at 22 Upper Wimpole Street, so he suggested to me we ought to start in the Maudsley, which I thought was a very peculiar thing to do. So um, I used to come into his room, lie down on his couch, and I was very worried that people might open the door and look in and what was going on here. <laughs> and I had some suspicions as whether he was doing this in NHS time <laughs> or not, you know, which was difficult to articulate. And I was, I'm sure it wasn't, but still, it was a, it was a difficult situation. <laughs> yes, yes. You probably brought him. You used to drive him. Well, no, yes. When was that? Um, well, that was in the <coughs> mid-1950s, early 1950s. And then I moved to Upper Wimpole Street. But um, working on his firm in the outpatients, what was impressive was that it was a very well organized firm. A large number of patients coming for outpatient psychotherapy. I don't even remember there was a board with all the names of all the patients on it. And it was carefully classified as to when people came, when they'd changed a group, and so on. And. Uh, he used to run a group supervision seminar in one of the rooms in the outpatient department. And sometimes there would be 10, 12 registrars there. I remember Bruce Sloan being there, Eduardo Keltizal, you were there as well. Large number of people. And it was a free-floating discussion in which he was fairly quiet, but had an authority about him. And um, he, as I said, ran a well-organized group department. 
Uh, within the Maudsley, he wasn't terribly comfortable, I think, in some ways. It was all right as long as he was in the outpatient department. But the Monday morning conferences with Aubrey Lewis, when Aubrey would put everybody through their paces and really cross-examine people and sadistically would say, now, Dr. So-and-so, from a psychoanalytic point of view, what would you say and what would you do? And there'd be Clifford Scott there, and there'd be Gillespie, who never said a word. Um, Scott would rise to the bait, and he would jabber away. Uh, Fuchs was very uncomfortable in those situations. He found it very difficult to stand up and speak. You know, back in his own department, he had a sense of authority. But in the mixed situation, he didn't really like to stand up. What people said about his arrogance, I, I never thought of him as being arrogant. Unless you can define someone who's principally interested in his own ideas as being arrogant. That's what he had. He was interested in his own ideas, not particularly interested in anyone else's. Sometimes I used to go across you know, on a Saturday or a Sunday in the afternoon, He'd ask me if I'd like to come for a talk or something of that sort, or I'd said to him, there's something I'd like to talk about. And I knew within a few minutes that it wouldn't be anything that I wanted to talk about. It was what he wanted to talk about. And he would go along in a sort of free, associative, discursive way, very often smoking a cigar at the same time. And you could see that he was working around his ideas. And James Anthony had a very nice description in his Fuchs lecture. It's like watching fishes in the water. And every now and then you get a glimpse. You can see, then it moves away again, comes back again, away and back. And so that was not arrogance, but the sense of a creative thinker thinking his own thoughts. And if I would say to him, well, that reminds me of so-and-so or someone else, is I, and what do you think about that? A certain sort of tired, glazed look would come into his eyes. <laughs> Let's get rid of that and get back to me. <laughs> um, on, on one occasion, I remember people were getting very angry with me. It may even have been you, Mark. I'm not quite sure. And um, I, I, I said to him, I said, listen, I don't think this anger is really relevant to me at all. I think he w you wanted, or whoever it was, yes. wanted to attack you. And he said, I'd rather they attacked you. <laughs> do, do, you <laughs> yes. do you remember yes. that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> He never quote people clearly, mm -hmm. and many times his ideas, uh, he would uh, make other people ideas, his ideas, but then were his ideas. Yes, yes. And, and, and he, he never, you know, when he's quoting somebody or no, and it's not that he is appropriating himself of, of uh, the ideas of another, but it's they are his already. Th I and that's important historically, because to actually discover the sources of his ideas is very difficult. Yes, yes. Where did they come from? What was it that he made his own synthesis from? It's a difficult task. He wanted to conceptualize his ideas, his work. He was looking for the concept, for the group analytic concepts, which would differentiate group analysis from other uh, practices. And for instance, I had an idea on the development in group, uh, on uh, uh, mirroring, which uh, Malcolm Pines later um, uh, developed too, uh, and uh, he was very attentive to this idea of mine because it gave him a way of um, um, understanding better his concept. So my experience is that he was looking for something, that he was always asking questions in relation to his way of doing things and trying to differentiate it. And he had uh, this difficulty in uh, creating new dimensions for the group analytic stance, which is in some way uh, different from his psychoanalytic orientation, uh, but had always this background. And I remember, for instance, I was very surprised because in my first article I wrote, he immediately published it, and it had these first concepts integrated in my reasoning and but I had um, one in one sentence I spoke of um, uh, projective identification and he said I must not use that terminology uh, I could it was not necessary uh, you, I could use um, projection and 
um, identification, but not projective identification, uh, that concept was not needed not? for the purpose. Why not? What? He didn't say why. I changed my, my um, <laughs> uh, naming of the process I was trying to describe, and I tried to penetrate better the concept of mirroring. And the I went on from there till today. He didn't like the Kleinian concept. Uh, you know he wasn't he familiar with, uh, this was uh, 63 or 4, something like that. Um, he, um, his um, relationship with, uh, with Bean was always very respectful, but very distant. Uh, and he, he just uh, didn't think uh, those ideas fitted. And when he was uh, put against the wall uh, with a conceptual framework, then he became very sure of himself. I didn't never th uh, thought of it as arrogant. I uh, always felt it was a way of trying to straighten out his way of thinking it. He felt I had been too beyond. I, I'd used the theories of, of beyond, of basic assumptions, theory, and so forth. And um, he, he, didn't, he didn't like that. And he invited Marianne, my wife, and I to dinner. And that, th that was the summons, that an invitation to oh, dinner, invitation but it was dinner. really That's a right. summons. Yes, yes. Yeah. And Elizabeth made a delicious dinner. And as we finished, um, I think that uh, he and I, withdrew, he insisted that we withdrew to the yeah. sitting room, leaving Elizabeth and Marianne in the, kitchen, in the dining room kitchen. And uh, he sat me down in a chair opposite him and he placed by my side a bottle of Hein Antique Cognac, one of the finest cognacs there is, a full bottle, I remember it. And, um, um, and he began to talk. And he insisted that um, uh, there was no need to introduce Bion or Bion's theories, and that everything could have been explained in group analytic uh, theory alone. And I believe that we talked for three hours, um, very late. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we kept, we, we could not find the common ground. And in the end, he said to me, well, if we really cannot agree, then we must be prepared to change the group analytic theory. And that was the time when I felt personally most close to him. He really seemed quite open to the possibility of modifying the theory, if, if required. He never did, but uh, well, I never did either. We just, uh, just separated them. He did have this idea that group analysis should be the comprehensive theory that everything should be under that umbrella. I know he felt the same about systems theory. I remember him having a long conversation with Helen Durkin. Why do you need systems theory? It's all in group analysis. He's, I mean, that was his baby, of course. Uh, once he was talking about uh, Bion, uh, it was the only time I saw him really becoming angry. He <laughs> said, this is rather a fascistic idea. He said that the individual is as much as he can do and can mean and be for the communion. This is a fascistic idea. So he really was angry in talking about beyond. So I Did think... you use the word fascistic? Yes. yes. Because Brinkman was uh, on the top uh, echelon of the psychoanalysis at, the, at this point, he told me that uh, uh, it, w it was... An, an option between him or Bion for running the in the Tavistock, and was Ringman who mm, who got the, the job for Bion. I don't know if it's historically true. I heard the same story. Yes, well, I think Elizabeth has said that uh, Rickman, in the end, apologized. I think to Michael when Rickman was in his last years and so on that he apologized to Michael for having blocked him, but. Um, <coughs> I remember him talking to me about what it was like when he came from Germany. He said Ernest Jones was very kind to him and he used to spend a lot of time with Jones. He used to sit on, on some of his consultations and that he felt that was his introduction to uh, psychoanalysis in England. And I think we shouldn't forget that he gave his paper in, was it 37 on introjection, 36 or 37, which was his introduction to the psychoanalytic society because he became a training analyst for Anna Freud. And uh, he did this paper on introjection, published when his name was still spelled F-U-C-H-S. So some people don't actually realize that the paper on introjection is by S.H. Fuchs, although it's in the collected papers. And it was his 
challenge in a way to the Kleinian group because they were all concerned and he felt over concerned with projection. And so he strung together a lot of the ideas about introjection and his own ideas. And I think that's an important thing to remember so that his opposition to the concept of projective identification yes. you know, yeah. was part sure. of that yeah. same ongoing argument. Mm. Yeah. I was uh, so privileged to be in his four weeks intensive course in uh, 1974 where Elizabeth has been to in Alt Aussee. And uh, he did everything in this course. He did uh, the experiential group, he did theory, and he did supervision. And it was no problem for him. He, he was always very clear. But when we came to points where uh, he thought that was not very important for the moment, he said, we come to it. And this became 